they've offered a corridor that links yes. this building to the next building, it would be more difficult to find this beautiful room. I welcome you all here, and we're here to hear a uh, lecture from Sally Bank of uh, Stanford University. Uh, Sally went to uh, undergraduate, I believe, at Barnard, got her PhD at Berkeley, spent many years at the Berkeley uh, National Laboratory, where she became head of their uh, Earth uh, Resources Division, Earth Sciences Division. Uh, she then moved to Stanford, where she is a professor, professor of Earth Sciences, uh, really an expert at uh, petroleum engineering, <coughs> flow and porous media, tomography of uh, samples of uh, huh? tomography of samples. Was that? <laughs> I'm supposed to do my homework. Uh, so she's a professor there. She's head of the energy and climate program at Stanford, and she's also a co-director of the Precourt Center for Energy uh, at Stanford University. Uh, she is a terrific person, a real leader in the field of energy research and analysis here at home and abroad. She's going to talk to us about uh, linking science innovation the world energy systems. No, but she's going to talk to us about energy systems analysis a very important subject. I just spent a month at Stanford University as a guest at the Precourt Energy Institute, and Sally was my boss. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot tell you how much better she is than the bosses I've had here at MIT. <laughs> but it was a fantastic time. I was tremendously impressed with the energy and the activities going on at Stanford. I think we are extremely fortunate to have her here as our guest today and also to learn about what she's about there. So thank you very much. And I hope. Well, uh, thank you very much, John. And it is true, we did have him at Stanford for a month and we shared an office suite. And I have good news to report that he behaved really, really well. <laughs> which you might find a surprise, but, uh, but he did do one thing. So we had a very nice dinner with uh, Sigolin Royal, who, of course, was very proud of the uh, Paris accomplishments. And John made the point that it wasn't ambitious enough and there should have been a carbon tax amongst the OECD. So anyway, so, so that made a little ruffle at dinner. But other than that, he really behaved well, so you can be proud of him. Um, anyway, it's also really nice to see, be here with uh, Bob Jaffe that I work with in Pakistan. We've, I think, for five or six years now, we've been going together to uh, a small uh, new science of, uh, school, uh, school of science and engineering uh, in Pakistan, trying to help make a go of that. So anyway, it's really terrific to be here. Um, just a quick uh, show of hands. How many people here are students? OK. Oh, good. All right. Well, I love that. So I run, a, a, well, up until this year when I handed it off, I run a weekly energy seminar at Stanford. And it's very much the same thing where we bring in outside speakers and we get to hear what's going on in the world of energy. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I'm going to be talking about uh, making good energy choices, uh, the role of energy systems analysis. So before I go on, though, I have to uh, acknowledge my extraordinary postdocs uh, and students who've been working on this with me, uh, Charlie Barnhart, um, uh, Michael Carbajalas-Dale, uh, Matt Pello, uh, all at Stanford, uh, Chris Emmett, who came to visit us from Imperial, and Marcus, who came uh, from the Technical University of Munich to work on this. And I can say that through their extraordinary efforts and my asking about a gazillion questions, they really helped me deepen my understanding of the energy system. So I'm very grateful to them. So I want to just start off by setting the stage that, that we're in the middle of, or, or perhaps the beginning, of an enormous transition in our energy system. And it's driven by a number of factors, uh, depending upon where you sit in the world. It could be pollution concerns. It could be climate change. It could be that all of a sudden we have lower cost renewable energy available in some places. 
Uh, it could be that we have plentiful and low-cost gas in the United States. It could be cheap oil, security concerns. Regardless of the perspective you bring to this, the energy system is changing, and it's a state of, in a state of tremendous flux. And one can anticipate that these changes are going to continue uh, really over certainly the next five or six decades and probably throughout the century. So the question is, as we're sitting at the very beginning of this energy tr uh, transition, is how do we make good choices? You know, where the energy system has a, a very long um, uh, uh, period during which infrastructure remains in place. Once you build something, it's going to be there for 30, 40, or 50 years, or 60 years if it's a nuclear plant. So the decisions we make today, the in industrial investments we make today, are going to have long-term impact. So, so it behooves us to try to figure out how to make good choices. So just some of the kind of examples, you know, what are the best kind of batteries for grid scale storage, or is storage a good idea at all? Uh, what's better? Should we be running natural gas peaker plants to help manage the variability of, of renewable uh, energy, or should we, should we put in storage? Um, how much should we subsidize renewable energy? The more we subsidize it, the faster it grows. What, is, what does it mean to have a really rapidly growing renewable energy industry? On transportation, do we want battery electric vehicles, internal combustion vehicles? Do we want fuel cell vehicles? How do we know? Um, and for new technologies, I, I, I suspect many of you are working on new technologies. At Stanford, we do a ton of work on, on uh, synthetic fuels and uh, new fuel cells and new batteries, trying to find new catalysts, whatever. Um, how do you know which aspects of that system that you really need to improve the most? Should it be the, the efficiency? Should it be the lifetime? Should it be the material choice? Should it be the cost? You know, wh what's most important to work on? And, and more broadly, what are the metrics that we should use to decide whether one technology is better than another? Okay, so, so the sort of classic example of this was, you know, should we use plastic bags or should we use, uh, you know, uh, regular paper bags for groceries? And, you know, how do you answer that question? So, uh, so that's what I've been working on. Um, and often, so I, I spend a lot of time talking to industry and almost invariably industry says, what does any of this stuff matter? It's really cost. And you know, certainly cost is a hugely important factor. And in the long term and at a steady state, costs very well may uh, be the best measure of what the best choices are. But they may not provide the answers, especially very early on in the development of, a, of a new technologies. Uh, there are issues such as unpriced externalities. Mostly people like to refer to the carbon dioxide emissions with burning fossil fuels. But there are very many unpriced externalities. Uh, as an example, the local environmental impacts associating with mining materials for, for energy, energy conversion or storage devices like batteries. The other thing is, is that if you look at today at almost every component of our energy system, it has some form of subsidy. Uh, and so when you're just looking at cost, it's very difficult to really figure out, well, what is the real cost of this? Because you know, there, there's a hidden overlay of subsidies. Um, another issue is that early stage technologies are, too, are often too immature to even figure out what they would cost. So for example, we're doing a lot of work on looking at CO2 recycle to make fuels. And we don't know the materials. We don't know the processes. Um, nevertheless, we're trying to decide, is this really a good idea, or should we go other, other pathways? So it's too early to even figure out costs. So we need other metrics to figure this out. The other thing is co-benefits are often not included in costs. And, and uh, you know, a good example, if we go to a hydrogen-based transportation system, well, we could use hydrogen for other things. And, and if you're just looking at transport, you're sort of neglecting the fact that the development of that technology could have other benefits. And then the other factor is this sort of short-term supply excess and deficits have a huge impact on, on energy prices, because basically energy and, and, and many energy conversion devices are just commodities. So we see fluctuations. And again, if we're trying to make choices based on, on short-term uh, excess or deficits, we won't make good answers. So, so what I'm looking for are measures in addition to costs that can help figure out how to make good energy choices. 
So energy systems analysis can help, uh, again, and, and when I say energy systems, we're typically looking beyond individual component costs or, or, or device characteristics. We want to be able to consider the interactions and trade-offs between different parts of the energy system. Uh, so for example, what's the impact of electric cars on the electric grid? What kind of costs or other environmental impacts might be associated with that? Uh, we want to consider the co-benefits of various technologies. So for example, what are the health benefits of renewables? And we'd like to consider not a single metric. So, so when somebody says to you, well, you know, is a sodium sulfur battery better than a lithium ion battery and, and the efficiency of one is this and it's another that. Well, well their efficiency, for example, isn't the only metric. Power density isn't the only me metric. Energy de density isn't the only metric. So how do we de develop integrated metrics that uh, allow us to do this? So, uh, so I just want to say for a minute, like why, why, do, why have I been interested in doing this? So I have since 2007 been the director of a project called the Global Climate and Energy Project. We invested in very, very early stage um, new energy conversion concepts. Uh, so things where sort of at that intersection of cutting edge science and new technologies that if successful, that they could have a huge impact on, on the energy system. And so all of the time we were having to try to figure out which are those kind of technologies which are likely to be able to scale and have these positive impacts we're seeking. And so this was one attempt to try to get information to help us do that. So just very briefly about energy systems analysis. So if you talk to people, everyone has a different concept about energy systems. Uh, you can have component technology models or metrics. Uh, you can do things like life cycle analysis that consider everything from the, the mining to, uh, to, to the ultimate disposal of, of, the, of, the, of the devices and materials. You can have bottom-up technology integration models. Uh, and then you can have integrated assessment models which sort of consider economy-wide um, or regional macroeconomics and even sometimes coupled to climate change. And uh, so, so there are all these different uh, approaches you can take. Uh, most of the work that, that I'll be talking about falls in this sort of bottom, bottom category at the sort of nexus between life cycle analysis and component technology models or metrics. But really, the same kind of thinking is extremely beneficial uh, along this whole chain. OK, so my goal in the time we have is to talk about three different examples where we have found this very useful. Uh, the first has to do with sustainable growth of the PV and wind industries. So how fast can these industries go before they, in fact, become a drag on the energy system? Next, I'll talk about some work in uh, grid scale energy storage, uh, trying to figure out which technologies or approaches are best. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about is it better to just use natural gas plants, turn them on and off to manage the variability of renewables as compared to storage. And if there is any little time at the very end, I'll, I'll talk about some very recent work that we're, just, uh, that we're just writing up on a comparison between battery electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles for, for transportation. And it's been a very interesting study comparing uh, a use case for um, for uh, California versus Germany uh, on the question of fuel cell vehicles or battery electric vehicles. But I may not have time to get there. OK, so, uh, so let's start off with some basic concepts that have been very useful for us for framing, uh, framing these questions. And it builds on a, a form of life cycle analysis called net energy analysis. And the basic idea is that it takes energy to make operate and dispose or recycle the devices or systems needed to produce energy. So you certainly need a certain amount of energetic investment to get energy back. So that's the basic idea. And if a device is to be useful, you want the energy output from that investment of energy to be far greater than the amount of energy that it took to actually build it. So the, the bigger the energy output compared to the input, the better it is from, from this perspective. And uh, I, I'm guessing these slides will be available to you. So if you're interested, there are six papers that, that uh, summarize uh, the work that I'm going to be talking about. 
I'll say a little bit more about why we also started this. So I'm sure many of you know Nate Lewis. I'm sure he's come to visit you. And he always loved to say that uh, to me that uh, photovoltaics had never produced any electricity uh, to the grid, that, that they were just consuming all the energy that they put out and more. And it was like, wow, is this really true? And so, so that was kind of what, what started us along this pathway. OK, so uh, here's a picture of a beautiful utility scale uh, photoelectric uh, uh, electricity generating station. And so if we're going to think about the net energy of this system, uh, we can think about um, how net energy would apply in this context. So this is a little diagram that anything above that uh, horizontal line, this is an energy output. Anything below this line is an energy input. So with a photovoltaic device, we can imagine that it's going to take a certain amount of uh, energy to mine the materials, to purify them, and to manufacture the cell and install it and so forth. So this is uh, before we get any electricity out, we're making an energetic investment. And then uh, we install it. It starts producing power which is what we want. Um, at the same time, we might need a little bit of energy to clean the panels or, or something. It's probably quite little, but uh, anyway, in principle, it can be there. And then finally, at the end of the life cycle, we need to take it apart or recycle it or whatever. Okay, so, so that's how it works. And this is for a single device. This is one, one panel or, 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 or one uh, utility scale plant. So just briefly, a couple of definitions. So embodied energy is the amount of energy to manufacture and install a device. Okay, so that's basically corresponding to that uh, blue bar that we saw before. Uh, the cumulative energy demand is the total energy inputs over the life cycle. And when we do this kind of analysis, uh, we ignore the fact that the sun actually does provide an energy input. We, we assume that that energy is free. Uh, the next one is energy return on investment. So this is the number we want to be very big, just like in finance, you want a big return on your investments. <laughs> so this is the sum of all of the energy outputs, so the yellow part of that diagram, compared to, to the energy inputs. And then finally, there's the energy payback time. And that's the time for these cumulative energy outputs to be greater than, uh, than the energy inputs. So again, the shorter the payback time, the better off. So if you have, for example, a big oil well, and you finally go out and you start producing oil, and it's a big gusher, uh, you get paid back really, really quickly, which is one of the reasons that, that oil investments are very um, enticing from an energetic point of view, because you can repay your uh, investment in a fairly short time. OK, so, so we just have to think about one more idea before we go on with this, with this discussion. So everything I've said right now is for a single device. It's for your single photovoltaic panel. But in reality, if we think about the, the PV, it's a whole industry. And we need to think about the entirety of the manufacturing infrastructure and installed cells and so forth, because one device, whereas it's interesting, it's not that important. So this in, illustrates the concept of an industry level net energy. OK, so again, here's the solid line. This corresponds to 0. Anything above the line means it's producing uh, energy. Anything below the line uh, implies it's consuming energy. So in the early stages of all uh, energy industries, or all industries, in fact, that you know, you're, you're spending energy, um, but you're not getting much back. And particularly when, uh, if your industry is growing very, very rapidly, you have to keep plowing more and more energy back into the system uh, in order to sustain its growth. So one can think of this as an energy subsidy, uh, that we're having to take energy from another part of the industry. So in China, it's a perfect example, we're taking uh, uh, energy from coal. Uh, based electricity generation, and we're investing it in the manufacturing of, of photovoltaic plants. So we have this energy subsidy. And in reality, if we look at how all technologies scale, at some point they become so big they can no longer sustain such rapid growth. The rate of growth slows down and, and perhaps at some point stabilizes. So there is some point in time 
where you break even so that you're actually uh, producing as much uh, energy as you're consuming, okay, so that you have a break even year. And then you still have to pay back this energy. You still want to pay this back. Okay, so there's a period that you have to pay it back. And then there's a payback year, meaning that basically all the energy subsidy it took to build this industry has been paid back. So, so those are some basic concepts. Okay, so now let's figure out, let's put some numbers into all of these equations. And it turns out that there's quite a bit of, of literature on the cumulative energy demand for photovoltaics being either the cumulative energy demand to actually build the cells, but also even to install it. And there's quite a long literature going back to the 1990s. These ideas were actually became salient in the 70s during the first energy crisis. And, uh, and so we have the cumulative energy demand versus time. So we actually went back and put, the, put these in terms of when they were published, because when we first took the whole data set, it was just a big mess. Uh, so what you can see is that um, you have a certain manufacturing energy, and at some point it actually started to, to go down. And actually, when it, we've been able to very nicely demonstrate learning curves for the energetic inputs to, to PV panels uh, for every kind of technology, all of the, the um, silicon and, and thin film technologies. Okay, so, so we have uh, the cumulative energy demand. And in 2013, uh, it took about two kilowatt hours of electricity to make one watt peak panel of silicon, uh, one uh, silicon PV panel. So, uh, so that's a number to remember. Okay, so now let's look at our energy flows uh, for this system. So we have our initial investment, and that's two kilowatt hours per, per watt peak. Um, and then we install it, and it keeps operating. And, and we said for our example that it's going to operate for 25 years. And we also chose to neglect the fact that it might take a little bit of energy to keep the panels clean and so forth. Uh, so we go for 25 years. And so every year, uh, the amount of output depends on the, 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 the watt peak times a capacity factor. That is the fraction of, of time one can think of it, or the fraction of the maximum output it would have achieved over that time period. So, so, a big, so we found the cumulative energy demand, but what is, what is this capacity factor? And it turns out that the um, IEA and UN actually collect quite a bit of data, not on the um, actual device, uh, device level capacity factor, but you can reconstruct industry level capacity factor statistics uh, from that data. And uh, that little graph is shown here. And it turns out that it's about 12%. Um, so is 12% a big number or a little number for PV? Any guesses? Anyway, it's a little number, yeah? It could be a lot higher. Well, why might it be so low? These are global statistics on, on PV. OK, it's in Germany. OK? So basically, these very low capacity reflectors reflect the fact that so much of this PV was installed in locations that, that are, are non-optimal. But anyway, that's what it is. Uh, but, but we can take that number, and then we can make a calculation, and we can figure out the energy return on investment based on that simple scenario. So the energy return on investment is just, what, one watt peak times this 12% capacity factor times uh, 25 years and a little more arithmetic. Anyway, you come out with the idea that the energy return on investment for a single PV panel using these global statistics is about 13, which is pretty good. So, so somehow that the idea that, we have, that a panel never pays back you know, the energy it took to construct it is certainly not true. Um, and in fact, the energy payback time you know, based on, on the, the, uh, those two uh, two uh, kilowatt hours per watt peak, uh, is about two years. So that's pretty good. So it says for an individual device, uh, you know, these are good participants. They contribute way more energy than, than it takes to make them. So that's what I just said. All right, so, so let's move on, though, to, to the industry. As, as I said, that we're not just interested in an individual panel, but we're actually interested in the industry uh, as a whole. And here's some nice data showing the, the growth of the growth of the PV uh, installed capacity. And, uh, and about 90% of this is silicon. So, so the, the rest of the discussion will focus on, on silicon. 
So now if we think about this growing industry so that every year we need to invest more and more energy to support the growth of this, we need to build factories and so forth. So you can kind of picture this little diagram. And, and let's picture we have a system that's growing a, a, at 100% and has the characteristics of the, uh, of the existing PV panels. So we put it in in year one, it starts producing power, uh, about half that. Uh, year two, we need to invest more energy and so forth. And so you can see that at 100% growth weight rate with this kind of um, uh, cumulative energy demand, uh, basically we're always investing more energy uh, than it's putting out. Okay, so you can go on. So, uh, so that could happen. I'm not saying it is. That, that's what could happen if you have an industry that's growing so fast and your, and your you know, energy um, payback time is on the order of two years. OK, so, uh, so enter the fabulous chart from uh, one of my amazing postdocs. And um, I could have probably spent the whole time on this one chart, but you'll be appreciative that I'm not. So what this chart shows you is the relationship between the rate at which the industry is growing or can grow and the cumulative um, electricity demand uh, for m manufacturing these cells. Uh, and, and also, we have an energy payback time, uh, assuming, uh, in this case, 11.5% capacity factor. OK? And so if you're on this line here, you break even. You're consuming all the energy you're producing, but you're not requiring a subsidy for, for, the, for the growth of the industry. OK? So we can look at an example. So we're, say, at uh, 2 kilowatt hours electricity per watt peak. If we want to be uh, neutral, it turns out that's like 50% growth rate. So we can sustain a 50% growth rate and still be a net electricity producer. OK, and all these lines, of course, so if it's way down here, it's you know, a really big electricity producer. If it's way back here, it's really requiring a huge subsidy. So, so what is the PV industry actually doing? Uh, so here's some data here. This is, uh, this is data based on uh, what we know about the learning curves for cumulative energy demand uh, and the growth rates. And it's disaggregated by various sectors. So the yellow shown here, this is for single um, crystal silicon. Uh, the orange is for multi-crystalline silicon. Um, this is CAD-TEL. OK, so those are the big ones. So, so what you will see is that initially, the growth was pretty small. Uh, so we were a net electricity producer. All of a sudden, bam, the, energy start, the industry started to grow very quickly. All of them went over into the period where they were being subsidized, you know, as we built all these factories in China. Um, but, but come 2012, uh, what we see is all of these technologies fall back into being a net electricity producer. So, so that's pretty good news. So our initial growth of the PV industry, spurred by all of the investments in, in Europe and, and, uh, and elsewhere, um, has paid off. So we're now, you know, the photovoltaics are providing a real benefit to our electricity system today. So, uh, so if we look at this, um, uh, we did all kinds of statistical analysis and, said, and concluded that the uh, energy break-even year was sometime between 2012 and 2014. And the energy payback year is between 2015 and 2017. And one of the questions you might ask, though, is, well, we've been producing all these panels in China, which has a very coal intensive coal industry. When are we going to pay back all the carbon? that it took to, uh, to manufacture these cells. Uh, and that's more like 2018, 2019. But uh, anyway, so, uh, so basically, from my perspective, using these metrics, photovoltaics are a good energy choice. Um, if you look at wind, wind has an enormous energy return on investment. It's about uh, between 80 and 90. So it's actually much more favorable than, than photovoltaics are from, from that perspective. So now let's move on. OK, so we've decided that renewables, at least from this perspective, are a pretty good idea. Um, but of course, we know that the sun doesn't always shine. The wind doesn't always blow. Uh, the demand for electricity doesn't match up with, with uh, when these renewable energy resources are available. So we need to figure out how to help integrate these into a grid where basically we have 24-7 demands for power. 
So energy storage is one of those options uh, that, that can be available to do this. And so we can have pumped hydropower. Uh, we could have compressed air energy storage. Uh, we could have batteries. And we, in particular, looked at lithium ion, sodium sulfur, vanadium redox flow batteries, zinc bromine, and lead acid. Um, or you have an alternative to use uh, hydrogen, where you would, um, you would have an electrolyzer. So when you had excess uh, electricity, you could make hydrogen. You could then compress it and then, uh, and then uh, use it in a fuel cell um, when, you, when you needed it. So these are the, these are the, uh, the uh, different uh, storage options that we evaluated. But the, and then again, what becomes the right metric, right? Is it efficiency? Um, is it, is it uh, a power density or energy density? What, what characteristic? And, and answering that is really very complex because when we think about backing up renewables on the grid, there are many, many technical challenges. But we're just looking at it really from one dimension. So, so the question is, what isn't some kind of integrated metric that might tell us which one of these options is better? So we got the idea that just like you have an energy return on investment for a primary energy source like solar or wind or whatever, why not have a metric called energy stored on energy invested? So it would tell us for every kilowatt hour of electricity that we invested in building a storage device, over its lifetime, how much could it deliver back from storage? OK, so we have this metric. We called it ESOI. And, uh, and, uh, and it's basically the electricity delivered back to the grid divided by the embodied energy that it took to, to manufacture it. And we compare all these different technologies. So we lump these into what we call geologic uh, energy storage. So that's uh, pumped hydro and compressed air energy storage. And we have the battery technologies here. And then here we have uh, hydrogen. So if we look at the, these geologic storage options, what we can find is that the energy stored on any energy invested, so think about uh, pumped hydro. We need to, um, you know, we need to excavate uh, you know, the, the mountain to prepare it to build the dam. We need to you know, have all the concrete to build the dam. We need to build the turbines and, and so forth so that we can operate this facility. And if you take all the energy that re was required for that and you compare it to the amount of energy that over the lifetime of a pumped hydro facility you can deliver, it's like 700 times. So basically, pumped hydro from, and from this perspective is an absolutely excellent energetic investment. And similarly, compressed air energy storage is also a really a good investment. And, and basically, they last a really long time. And uh, they can store large amounts of, uh, of energy for, um, for, for the amount of energy that it took to build it. OK, so let's move over to batteries. So uh, the first one we have is a lithium ion battery. So a lithium ion battery uh, can produce about or deliver about 32 times more energy than it took to build it. So that doesn't seem so bad. I mean, it's nowhere close to these. Those are awesome. But uh, uh, if we look at sodium sulfur, it's about 20. Uh, vanadium redox, it's about nine. Uh, uh, it's about 10. Um, zinc bromine is about 9. And lead acid is about 5. So you get down to 5, and you go, wow. So, so this lead acid battery that I'm hooking up with my PV system I have to invest one fifth of the energy it ever delivers, so th so that's not really that's not really too good. And if you look at what's happening in many parts of the developing world, it's lead acid batteries we're putting in. We do it because it's cheap, but we're really investing a huge amount of energy in trying to do that. Uh, so then, moving on to hydrogen, um, we we have uh, some different scenarios with uh, cylinder cylinder storage made of composites. Uh, we uh, have a reference case made of uh, basically metal, metal cylinders. Uh, we also looked at whether you could store hydrogen underground. Anyway, so, so the bottom line, if you look at these values, that the hydrogen system for us, um, has about a 40, say 30, 35 to 40 um, uh, energy stored on investment. So it compares sort of reasonably favorably from this metric to, uh, to, um, to the lithium ion battery. 
Okay, so, so, so that's interesting. So from this chart, I say, oh, these things are great. Um, lead acid is bad. And then we've got a whole bunch of things in here in, in the middle that you know, look like they might be reasonable. But what this metric doesn't tell you about is really what about the effect of the efficiency of these two different systems. So if you look at the, uh, the electrolysis and fuel cell system, if you look at the full system efficiency, it's about 0.3. And this is the round trip efficiency. This is electricity in compared to electricity out. So you're losing 70% of your energy to the process of making and compressing and, and then converting hydrogen back to, uh, back to electricity. And if we compare that to our lithium ion battery, our sort of best in class, we have 0.83. So on one hand, if we sort of go back to this chart, we said, hmm, hydrogen looks a little bit better from this perspective, but it definitely doesn't look as good from the efficiency. So which of these two things should I value more? How do I do that? So, oh, just one more thing. Why, why is the efficiency for the hydrogen system so poor? Basically, the full system efficiency is you have to multiply the efficiency of each of the components. So we have the efficiency of the electrolyzer, the efficiency of compressing the hydrogen, and then the efficiency of the fuel cell. And using these numbers, which were in the literature, this is how you get the 0.3. One can argue with any of these numbers, but it would be next to impossible to get anywhere up close to the, to the lithium ion battery value. OK, but we still have these two different metrics, what's more important. So we said, well, why don't we think about how putting these storage systems on affects delivery of electricity from the grid, or the energy return on investment uh, from, from electricity that we're generating, for example, from uh, um, renewable resources. So, so we're going to go through a thought exercise now. So we're going to imagine that we have a generator. You know, here we show a wind turbine. This could be PV. OK, and a certain fraction of the energy that is generated, 1 minus phi here, goes directly to the grid. So the energy return on investment from uh, the power that's generated and goes directly to the grid will actually just be the energy return on investment of the grid power. So for wind, I said that was between, say, 80 and 90. OK, but then there is a certain amount of, of energy that we are actually going to put into our storage device. And how much is delivered back to the grid is going to depend on, on how much energy it took to manufacture it, as well as the full system efficiency. So this way, we can integrate these two metrics into a single figure of merit, so we don't need to, to trade them off individually. And it turns out you can write down a formula for this energy return on investment to, uh, of, uh, to the grid uh, here, a very simple formula that just depends on these variables that I've just mentioned. OK, so, so that's useful. But, but then the question becomes, well, we need to consider how we're actually using storage, right? So if you have a storage device you're using every day, like for PV, and you're using it to manage you know, day-night variability, that's one use case. If you have something that you're using to back up wind and maybe you use it once every week, you know, that's going to be different. So, so we decided to get a handle on what might be better. We would ask a very specific question about, is it worth paying for grid storage you know, with energy? Um, and which technology is better? By considering the case where we're going to throw, we have two choices. We can either store the electricity, or we can throw it away, or curtail it. That's curtailment, OK? And, and we're going to compare whether we get more of an energetic benefit by storing it or whether our energy return on investment of the generation is actually better without storing it. Is that clear? That was a little bit of a complicated idea. OK, so, uh, so let's now look first at solar. OK, and uh, this we have the energy return on investment uh, to, for generation for, uh, for solar is, is 8. OK, so this is if we're going directly from PV to the grid. And this is for the aggregated um, PV system installed today, not the best technology that you could have installed in 2013. OK, so, uh, so if we're curtailing the, the solar power, 
Um, if we're curtailing nothing, the energy return on investment will be zero, will be eight. But the more we curtail, it's going to linearly drop down to zero. Okay, so, so this is the best it can perform depending upon how much we're curtailing it. So now we say, well, let's put on some storage and see whether we get a benefit. And so that's what all these curves are shown here. So this top one is pumped hydro. So one can see that by storing solar energy versus curtailing it, you're actually doing a lot better. Your energy return on investment stays very close to the, to the, to the actual uh, generation. On the other hand, if you look at some of these other technologies, let's pick lithium ion batteries, we're here. Um, actually, it's still pretty good. You're always better than curtailing it. As a matter of fact, all of these technologies, except maybe for, um, for uh, lead acid, uh, it's better. So, but the question is, is so I, I, I pose the question, do we want hydrogen or do we want uh, batteries? So if we look at our sort of best case lithium ion battery, we're here, and here is our um, fuel cell, our hydrogen system using a fuel cell and an electrolyzer. You can see it's significantly worse. So what's happening here is that even though that the energy stored on investment is better, the efficiency, that 0.3% efficiency is kind of killing us. Okay, but nevertheless, it says all these systems, it's actually worth storing the, the, the electricity. So let's go over to wind. Okay, so wind has a very, very high energy return on investment, or it's sort of like it's you know, energetically cheap. Okay, this is energetically expensive, this is energetically cheap. Okay, so if we put on pumped hydro or if we put on compressed air energy storage, actually, there's a benefit. You know, it's worth doing. But if we look at all of these battery technologies, actually, they all degrade the energy return on investment very, very significantly. And things like lead acid batteries, it just absolutely plummets. Uh, so, so basically, this tells us that, that, that you know, storing wind power using, uh, you know, using these you know, batteries or fuel cells might not be a great idea. Um, if we compare our hydrogen system for a, versus a lithium ion battery, it turns out they're both sort of equally good uh, until you get to the point where you're really using, uh, the, you're storing a lot, in which case then your lithium ion battery wins out. And again, that sort of comes down to an efficiency argument. So anyway, so that's kind of what that tells us. So, so just um, briefly, another, uh, another story about this same issue um, is what is the impact of putting storage onto our renewable energy system? How much of a drag does it? How much might it limit its sort of a growth rate that it can achieve? So we compare it for wind here and solar. So hopefully you remember this graph. Anything uh, above this red line means it's a net energy sink. You're having to subsidize it. Anything below here, it's great. Um, and so you can see here's wind. So here's wind without any storage. Wind is fantastic. It's a huge net energy producer. And what are shown here, uh, and one is onshore wind, and off, so this is uh, onshore wind, this is offshore wind, and we compare looking at different amounts of storage. So we have about 12 hours of storage, 24, 48, and 72. And so basically what you see is with wind, we can, because it's already so efficient, we can actually load it up with a lot of storage. And this is a mix of storage technologies, and, and it still is a net energy producer. So from that perspective, this is good. We kind of get a different story with solar, though. And let's focus maybe on uh, two, of, uh, two of the most interesting technologies. So if we look at our uh, multicrystal and silicon, uh, it's just moved into the net electricity producer domain. Uh, we put storage on it, and it gets pushed back over to be consuming. Um, but, but it can even accommodate up to about 12 hours of storage. And similarly, CAD tell is actually a little more energetically efficient. So, so two different stories. One says, you know, even though we're, we'd have to invest a lot of energy and storage, we can still do it if we have wind power with solar. Uh, it's, uh, we, we need to do better. OK, so that, that's sort of the, the macro picture. So I also mentioned that we've found it useful to use these kind of ideas to figure out how can we make technologies better if we're developing you know, new technologies or trying to improve the existing ones. And so this is a little illustration with regard to batteries, how you could make batteries better for grid scale storage using this metric, this energy stored on investment. 
And so for batteries, uh, it turns out this is a simple, it's a single device, so you can actually make a simplified uh, form of this energy stored on investment that just depends on the efficiency of the device, the depth of discharge, the number of cycles, divided by the, the cradle to gate energy it took to actually build it. Okay. So we have a metric. So, so if you want to make this metric better, you can increase the efficiency. You can uh, increase the depth of discharge while still preserving the number of cycles. Or you can increase uh, the cycle life. Or you can reduce the embodied energy. So, so we have four things we could do to make it better. And the question is, is which one will really move the dial? Which one will really make it better? And these are some complicated charts, which we won't go into. But the bottom line is, if you really want to improve this, if you want to get it close to being as good as things like pumped hydro, the real only knob we have is dramatically in uh, increasing the cycle life. Instead of lasting from hundreds to thousands of cycles, you know, we, we need something that you could cycle you know, on and off every day for um, you know, 20 or 30 years, just like a PV panel. So, so sort of a 5x improvement in the cycle life would fundamentally make these technologies much more uh, amenable to, uh, to grid integration. So now a lot of our efforts, it's a really gratifying that our battery programs are in many ways focused on increasing the cycle life, which is somewhat orthogonal to you know, energy density, power density, and cost. So, OK. Now we're just going to talk about one thing more, and I'm going to be quick. I told you I wanted to talk about natural gas, and you know, is it really worth putting batteries on the grid? Would we just do better if we um, if we just took natural gas peaker plants and turned them on and off to modulate, so we can always meet supply and demand? Okay, so how are we going to do this? What set of metrics might be useful? So we decided to look at two different metrics to evaluate this on. We decided to consider the carbon intensity or the kilowatt or kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Okay? So if we're comparing storage to, to natural gas, natural gas actually has significant emissions. Um, and then the second measure is the energy intensity, or basically the, the amount of energy that it takes we have to invest to build that system. So we have these two different measures, and, um, and we're going to look at that. So, but you always have to say, compared to what? So we decided to compare these options to what the grid average is. Okay, So we have a grid average uh, energy intensity of, uh, of 0 0.056 um, kilowatt hours per kilowatt hour of, of uh, of, man, of uh, energy delivered. And then we have our carbon intensity over here, which is uh, 0.55. OK, so, so that's our baseline. So, so then the question becomes, well, if we're trying to figure out whether we should store it or, or store the electricity or, or use natural gas generation, we can think about each one of these quadrants in a different way. OK, so picture something falls in this quadrant. It's actually more energetically efficient. It's got lower carbon intensity. So I, I kind of think of this as a do today. Really makes a lot of sense. You know, of course, you'd have to consider cost. Um, if we picture things over here, uh, it's really good on carbon. OK, that's important. But we're, we have a lot more of um, uh, energetic. You know, we're investing a lot more energy. So, so really, with this class of technologies, we would really like to improve the energy return on investment. We'd like PV to look a lot more like wind, as an example. Uh, if we're up here and we're, we're doing this, it's actually more carbon intensive and, uh, and, and more uh, energy intensive. So, so you know, we should avoid this. This is a really silly thing to do. And if we're in this quadrant, it's actually quite efficient energetically, but maybe it's putting a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. OK, so, so with this framing, we can now look at different technologies. So, so let's look at wind. OK, so now we're pairing wind with, with storage. Uh, and so here uh, uh, with wind, it's very, it's very efficient and has very low carbon emissions. So we can now imagine putting storage on it. So if we put uh, pumped hydro, uh, it moves it up here, so a little more carbon intensive and so forth. If we put a lithium ion battery, we're over here compressed air energy storage. Um, what about if we put lead acid battery? You know, we had this fantastic wind technology. We're now putting lead acid on it. All of a sudden, you know, both the carbon intensity 
because of the embodied energy and uh, efficiency get much worse. But, but these class of things are really, really good, very encouraging. Uh, if we look at PV, uh, PV pretty much all falls into this quadrant. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to build a PV device uh, compared to the amount of energy it puts out over its lifetime. So here's PV down here. If we look at adding storage, it pushes it up here. You know, in the worst instances like lead acid, you can see the advantages compared to the existing grid you know, become uh, diminishing. And if we look at what about storing just grid power? What if we kind of forgot about the fact that we were trying to reduce carbon intensity and improve energy efficiency? If we store grid power, all of these technologies look really bad. So don't do that. And then um, finally, uh, natural gas, actually. So natural gas combined cycle uh, is a little bit less carbon intensive than the grid. Um, uh, and about similar energy efficiency, so that's good. On the other hand, combined cycle plants are hard to ramp. Uh, this is our uh, natural gas combustion turbine peakers. This is best available technology, uh, a little bit worth, worse in terms of energy and, uh, and carbon. And then if we could manage to make uh, natural gas plus CCS, carbon capture and storage, in a way that it could follow load, uh, in fact, that would be quite a good technology and, and compare fairly favorably things to like lithium ion batteries plus wind. So, uh, so then uh, if you lump these broadly, you know, it allows us to start having a different conversation about the strategy for backing up, uh, backing up the grid and, and certainly says you know, that natural gas is not as good as wind from any of these metrics, but, uh, but, but in many circumstances may be sort of comparable to solar plus the worst forms of storage. So just very briefly wrapping up, um, I hope I've made the point that energy systems analysis provide new perspectives on, on energy technologies and systems beyond cost. Certainly cost is hugely important, but that might not tell the whole story. And just to, in case I completely baffled you, sort of main messages, uh, solar and wind are net electricity producers, which is a good thing. Uh, pumped hydro and compressed air energy storage are very good options for storage. All the other forms of storage are energetically expensive. Um, however, today lithium ion batteries are actually better than, than hydrogen from, from this perspective. What do we need to do to batteries to make them better? Basically, we need to make them last longer for grid storage. And for hydrogen, we really need to make the, the electrolysis, the whole system more efficient. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult to compete. And regarding natural gas generation, uh, it a, provides a better option than some, but, but not, as the good as, not as much as the best, like wind plus uh, storage. So anyway, thank you very much. Sure. Sure. Yeah. OK, questions? Uh, how about way back there? Thanks. Um, really interesting talk. Oh. Uh, thanks for a really interesting talk. Some of these metrics that you present are the sorts of things that seem almost obvious or very natural in hindsight, which I think is always the work of some or the mark of something really cool. Um, my question is: Have you thought about any of these in sort of? aggregate average, whether it's over the energy system that we have today, the current energy mix, or different potential pathways forward. You know, you looked at like PV and wind mm -hmm. in isolation, which is very illustrative, but uh -huh. in reality, we would imagine a mix of those both now and going forward. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how those numbers fall Right. Out. You know, we haven't. I, I think that those are logical. Once you define all these metrics, you can develop very simple equations that represent summations and, you know, of, of all these things. So I think that would be really something good to do for the entire energy system to, you know, to look at directionally. Are we doing the right thing? How can we, you know, what knobs provide us the, the biggest options to change quickly? Yeah, it's a, it's a good idea. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. I've looked at energy storage, and the projections I see say the vast majority of it is going to be standalone energy storage, but not paired with renewables. Mm -hmm. Can you, is that clearly said, avoid that? Yeah, well, all you're doing is you're taking something that's already sort of energetically, well, the energy efficiency is pretty good. They're fairly carbon intensive, and all you're doing is putting more carbon out because you're, you had to invest all that you know, energy in making those batteries. So yeah, storing you know, grid, grid power is really not, from an environmental point of view, a good idea. Might help with managing the grid, okay. 
but but by if we're trying no but if we're trying to improve the environment we should really think think differently yeah yeah okay how about right here yeah Thank you. I'm curious about, um, you show the energy surplus deficit. So riding on that line is nice that PV is not at fault, mm -hmm. but then it doesn't cut away at the rest of the energy system. So I'm curious if you link some of that into like, stabilization scenarios and mm -hmm. how much emissions you can have, and then look at basically uh -huh. the timing of how would you yeah. phase in PV into the system to reach those stabilization uh -huh. factors. Yeah, you know, that's uh, another really good idea. Uh, I don't know anybody who actually includes the energetic investments to build all this stuff in those models, and so that's another good project. Yeah. Okay, how about right here? Yeah. Hi, uh, if you think about the intersection of um, wind, power, and case, or the intersection of uh, geology and meteorology, where does that lead you on the map of North America as being good places? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think the Colorado. I think Wyoming, uh, Montana, um, actually even over into Illinois, even Iowa. You know, that, that nice wind belt, actually that sits sort of right on top of a sedimentary basin, which is really amenable for, for compressed air energy storage. Yeah, that's where I would start. Yeah, uh, I'll go back there and then I'll come up here, yeah. There's a PVC shell, uh, your chest, remember in the uh, cash flow chart and then in the uh, financial class, and in the case of cash flow, uh, we compared the uh, annual overall to the capital investment and compare it with the uh, uh, interest rate. And uh, is it possible to use similar concept for the uh, that flow? Uh, mm -hmm. like, uh, compare the annual recovery mm -hmm. to and the uh, energy now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I think so. You know, I'm not an economist, and uh, and I barely can balance my checking account. But but I do think that that's a. I think that that's an interesting idea to 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 take the analogy even farther than 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 we have. Yeah, yeah. Please. Early on, you had a PV industry plot, uh -huh. and it had all the patterns which I thought were really amazing mm -hmm. and captured. And it had different size of the sphere, but it didn't... Know oh, that was the size of the industry. Oh, okay. oh, yeah, sorry, right, yeah. So the size of the circle, so they were small, they, as they were growing, that meant they were the big ones. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Because I saw a pattern of a decrease in size. But it just kind of didn't yeah, well, some grow and some some don't, and yeah, yeah, but yeah, it was the size of the manufacturing. Yeah, how about over here? So have you thought about... Uh, I really like your metrics. I really like how they're a really simple kind of payback and return investment. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about trying to develop curves instead of point estimates? To give you an example, like you frame your talk in terms of beyond cost, right? Uh -huh. When cost, you get marginal cost, which are pretty good, and that kind of explains why, you know, mm -hmm. if you're an Indian village and you can't organize a grid, then you can't necessarily organize a geologic storage mm -hmm. system, right? That explains why you buy a battery. Uh -huh. And you get marginal costs in terms of, um, you know, the cost Right, to build a battery in a city mm -hmm. is not the same thing as the cost of energy. So, you know, in a way, like, mm -hmm. you know, in economics, you get this marginal cost curve. Mm -hmm. And I think your metrics might, have you thought about trying to use those kind of curves for scale? Um, no, uh, but I think that that, I, I think that that sounds like a, you know, I, I did, all of this conversation, you're all suggesting good ideas to, to amplify the, the financial analogy. Uh, and, and I think that that's a great idea. Actually, all of these things we've done a lot of, you know, we, we run them with a range of values, and we have a lot of sensitivity studies and sort of stochastic prediction of, you know, how they're working together. These I just showed single numbers because otherwise it just gets to be pretty complicated. But but the story doesn't change at all. But but yeah, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, how about over here? Um, the um, energy infrastructure model uh, using. Denmark and now a very similar one from Fraunhofer in Germany. And also the two models, the reference network model uh, and the Linsa model uh, for the future of the grid and the future of solar energy at MIT uh, Energy Initiative. Mm -hmm. They are uh, hour by hour simulation mm -hmm. models. Yeah. How important have you uh -huh. found hour by hour simulation? is uh -huh. in your energy return on investment to the grid uh -huh. when, when you calibrate the models mm -hmm. which are using. Right, yeah, now that's a good question. So, so we have done 
hour by hour modeling of looking at, for example, comparing batteries to hydrogen both for transportation and for things like backup power in the home and heating and cooling and so forth. We haven't taken those hour by hour models and looked at how those metrics, you know, all of these things when you make a real use case, you know, how it actually gets used, which you can do from that hour by hour things, all of those things could change that. So, so a, a good example would be if you have, um, a, if you want backup and you want backup one hour out of a, out of a month, the best thing you can invest in is something with a really um, small energetic investment. So you really want a high energy stored on investment. And you don't really care about efficiency. Okay? On the other hand, if you're having something that you use every day, like a battery you're using like eight hours a day for PV, all of a sudden efficiency becomes important. So the sort of convergence between by the hour by hour model and these metrics would also help tell you what are better choices. Right. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You could do hour by hour, extrapolated over a thirty year period, and then say, okay, well this was our theoretically theoretical energy return on investment. How did it really perform? Between you know over its life cycle, because maybe it only got used for half the time you wanted in the use. Yeah, yeah. Excuse anyway, me. yeah. Oh, okay. The guy in the green shirt there. Yes. Uh, so you mentioned that in your talk that uh, hydropower storage and compressed air storage are head and shoulders above other energy technology. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in the case of hydropower storage, it's infeasible in most locations mm -hmm. unless you have something like a river valley or a hill uh -huh. that you can hollow out. Yeah. I'm less familiar with compressed air storage. Are you uh -huh. referring to just having metal canisters in a basement? No, this would be like geological thing? scale. So basically, okay. you go to where well, you could make it in a salt dome, where you you know excavate the salt dome with hot water, or you can put it in a, a high permeability aquifer, just like you use natural gas storage. So so that's an uh, that's another option. Yeah. So so those are the geological. Once you put anything in a canister, so so really so we also looked at the case where you had seasonal storage of hydrogen and you have to build make a lot of canisters. All of a sudden you spend so much energy making all those canisters that 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 the hydrogen system looks very very unfavorable. Yeah. 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 How about right here? And when you're pulling the energies together, you mm -hmm. didn't take into account the fact that some energies are uh, energies are not equivalent. Right. Yeah, if mm -hmm. we talk about electricity, it's not obviously obvious. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. So as you say, we put a lot of energy doing canisters. Most of it is mm -hmm. energy. So right. Do you plan to do this kind of differentiation, or have you done those? Yeah. So we do. We actually carefully. So all of our early work, we use primary energy. And then at some point when we started to look at like energy return on investment for like integration between PV and, and storage, all of a sudden we realized it was better to convert everything to electricity. So you'll see ESOI sub E. So there are two different metrics. And yeah, we do, yeah, you're right. They're they're not all equivalent and you have to keep you have to keep track of them. And the PV manufacturing, actually a lot of it is electric. So, so using a, a primary electric metric is not a, not a bad thing to do. So, yeah. On that point, when you had a metric on the PV, you had a WP. Mm -hmm. mean oh, peak. So, you're That's not looking the, at all of the capacity factor. Oh, so. we do. Yeah. So we did look at the capacity factor, and that's when we came up with a number of like uh, uh, twelve percent, and that was world average in twenty. 13 or something like that. It's probably better now because more and more PV is being put in more favorable places, so I'm sure it's gone up, but that was it at then. Yeah. Let's just take a couple. Okay, how about one over here? It's been the spirit of the trade offs that you raised at the beginning of your talk. I want to ask a question about the metric that uh, would be the energy return on investment. Mm -hmm. So, if we think of this energy input that it takes to uh, push forward these technologies, not as necessarily something negative but some perhaps <coughs> activity potential in the mm -hmm. system or in the country that would have otherwise gone mm -hmm. to another activity that uh -huh. would have been more intensive in terms of mm -hmm. energy consumption and positive mm -hmm. pollution and things like that. So mm -hmm. is that something that you think we should consider or? 
Uh -huh. Yeah, no, I think that's an interest. So if you look in China, and China's investing a lot of energy in making, you know, batteries for for the grid and for PV panels and wind turbines, and, and one could differentiate that those are sort of green energy investments versus other. Um, so, yeah, no, I think that, that that's an interesting idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay, last question. Okay, how about, uh, how about way in the back? Next. Oh, next to last question. Okay. <laughs> Oh, you have the last question. Uh-oh, I'm scared. Yeah. So for institutions like MIT or the City of Cambridge who are looking to make investments in clean energy technology now for their own energy supply, mm -hmm. is the takeaway from here that you know wind really is the best renewable energy resource over solar, and ideally there's a little bit of higher storage to go along, or is there more nuanced? No, I, 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 well, there are grid integration issues that, that you, you know, need to consider. Um, but but sort of to first order, you know, wind is is an, it's got higher capacity factors. Uh, in the right place, it can be lower cost, and it has this phenomenally good energy return on investment. Yeah. How would you advise thinking about timing of those investments? Uh huh. Um, whenever you can talk your university into doing it. <laughs> Uh, at Stanford, we've done a huge amount. Uh, we've completely changed our energy system. We're having a PV array built in the in the in the, in the valley, uh, Central Valley. We um, completely redid our heating and cooling system and reduced our energy inputs for heating and cooling by seventy like percent. I don't know. I I think universities, you know, should be leaders. You know, especially technologically capable and and financially well off organizations like ours. Um, just okay. Fabulous. Just absolutely fabulous. You can tell from the audience. Okay, now here's the question. Well, no, first of all, I want to say <laughs> that it's an ex promos People who talk about making the university making these investments in energy uh, scare me to death. <laughs> so I have a, a question. I don't think I've ever heard anybody so proudly say, I'm not going to consider costs. I'm going to look at other metrics. Because everyone else considers cost. I have a question. I have a question. <laughs> There are two aspects which I do think you have to philosophically mm -hmm. worry about. They don't really involve costs, but they involve time discount. Mm -hmm. That is, whether the energy is used now to build it, mm -hmm. or you get it later. Mm -hmm. It's not a question of cost, mm -hmm. it's a question of how you consider the preference difference mm -hmm. now and later. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you do that, a lot of these results change, mm -hmm. and they won't really have a major point drunk into Cesspool of talking about costs. Uh -huh. And similarly with solar, I thought that if you did solar storage, storage on PV mm -hmm. devices, you're not going to use it to increase mindless but you're mm -hmm. going to decide what time to use this. Mm -hmm. You'll right. shape the solar right. to hide. But so you, you don't consider those qualitative timing features in your no, you know, and, and I, I, cost is always going to be important, and 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 so so this is an additional perspective. But I like your discount idea, because actually, that's, that's, that would hold your, I mean, that's not a cost issue. That's right. More yeah, that's more fundamental issue because ten years from now, if I'm building PV channel uh, panels in China, the ener the carbon intensity of their grid, you know, might be much better than than it is now, and so therefore. One could argue that well, we should wait till China cleans up its grid to to, to buy more PV from them. I, I don't really agree with that, but <laughs> but the idea yeah. of the time difference. Yeah, right. Yeah. Anyway, let's all thank Sally for the <laughs> yeah, And thanks for all the great questions. Uh, lo lots of food for thought. So thanks. Thanks very much.